The work undertaken by the Vive Thrill team is done with respect for and an understanding of the value of the myths, legends and lore of cultures and societies across the world. Although the sagas and tales we discuss have their origin in Norse Icelandic culture, they belong to all of humanity. We do not tolerate racism, prejudice or discrimination. We believe in fairness and equality for all, and stand against any kind of misappropriation of the material covered in this podcast by white nationalists or supremacists. Vidforil, the women pioneers in the Vinland sagas, a special series of the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. With these special episodes, Dr. Johanna Katrin Friedrichsdotter and myself will guide you through a fascinating analysis of the Viking Age of women who sailed the whale road to distant shores, living in the twilight of one belief and the dawn of another, who claim land, thriving against all odds and driven to seek out their own futures. They are Vidfurul, the women pioneers in the Vinland sagas. Episode 1. Uth the Deep-Minded. The Saga of Eric the Red. Chapter 1. In this episode, we will introduce Uyth the Deep-Minded, the renowned Viking woman and protagonist of the first section of the Icelandic saga called Eirik Saga Reyða in Old Norse, or the Saga of Eric the Red. Although the section featuring Uyth in Eirik Saga is relatively short, there is much to discuss about this woman and the turbulent events that throw her from one place to another and eventually to Iceland, where she ruled her domain as a matriarch. Uyth is a complex woman, someone who is remarkably brave and strong in the face of adversity, but who also did things that we find troubling and reprehensible today. To understand Uyth's outlook on life and her decision to go to Iceland, we will explore her backstory, referring to other Norse texts in which she features besides Eirik Saga and compare them with each other. In this way, we aim to flesh out her character and bring out which of its aspects different medieval authors wish to emphasize. We'll touch on the Norse expansion from Scandinavia to Ireland, Scotland and the islands surrounding it, and the violent struggles for political supremacy in these areas, in which Uyth and her family were actively involved. This is a dangerous world of intrigue and backstabbing, where a man can rapidly rise to power and conquer large territories, but be deposed and even brutally decapitated just as fast. A world where women participate in plotting, but are left to fend for themselves if things go awry for their male kin. We will view Uyth through this lens of contemporary politics, but also explore other aspects of her life such as the question of her Christian religion, which would have made Uyth a minority in a world full of pagans. Her position as someone who held people in slavery 
and her arranging her granddaughter's marriages add exploitative, steely and calculated aspects to her persona. And we will seek to understand these issues in context. Oath. Olav married Oath the Deep-Minded, daughter of Ketil Batnos, son of Björn an excellent man of Norway. Their son was called Thorsteinn the Red. And so we meet Oath Ketilsdóttir wife, daughter and mother. Oyd is mentioned in several different Icelandic sources. Apart from Eirik saga, she also appears in Laxtala saga, or the saga of the people of Laxá Valley, Orkneyinga saga, or the saga of the people of Orkney, and Landnamabók, or the Book of Settlements, a 12th century treatise about the settlement of Iceland. According to all of these sources, Uyth was the descendant of prominent Viking commanders and colonialists, whose names, careers and high-ranking social status would have been familiar to Eirik Saga's audience. Uyth's introduction emphasises two things, her family, and because of her nickname the Deep-Minded, her intellectual abilities. Uyth's father and both of her grandfathers were high-ranking men in Norway, and her father reconquered the Hebrides on behalf of King Harald Fairhair of Norway. But he subsequently refused to pay the king tribute, and the family was expelled from their homeland. Eith's husband was Olaf the White, a fierce Viking who became the king of Dublin and their son Thorstedt the Red was likewise involved in struggles for political supremacy in Scotland and the surrounding islands. Situating Oeth within this kin group immediately tells us that she is part of a family of ambitious Vikings who fearlessly sail between Scotland, the Hebrides, Orkney, Shetland and Ireland, where they harry, conquer and colonise. Eric the Red's saga begins with a sweeping account of the Viking raids and wars that took place in Ireland, Scotland, and the Hebridean and Arcadian archipelagos. How and why did the Norse leave Scandinavia for these new lands in the West? Along with many other skills they possessed, the Norse were master ship builders. Changes in the design of seafaring vessels improved their chances of exploring far greater distances at sea. Opportunities for discovery, trading and raiding, as well as colonisation in the West, were realised when, in the late 8th century, the well-known raids of monasteries on the islands of Lindisfarne in 793 and Iona in 795 took place, and marked the beginning of the Viking Age. Factors that contributed towards exploration included economic and social issues, such as trade. Norway had much to offer such as furs, fish, timber, walrus ivory, hides and slaves. A lack of arable farming land in the Norwegian fjords meant that the younger sons of families were presented with a very real problem when the time came to carve out their future. Another factor to consider was political unrest. Before Harald Harfagri, or Fine Hair, unified Norway as sole ruler in 872, Norway was comprised of petty kingdoms. The struggle between warring clans and families to secure control and land led to some either seeking out a safer place in which to live or seeking prosperity and fortune overseas. The sagas also describe the unyielding rule of Harald Feinherr, which perhaps reveals something of the opinions held by the saga authors themselves and his overturning of the long-standing customs of landholding. In the late 9th century, when Scotland and Ireland and farther afield were not only well developed and populated, Iceland was to become an increasingly appealing destination. The Scottish island of Shetland is only 180 nautical miles from the west coast of Norway. The Orkney Islands, 266 nautical miles, and the northwest coast of Caithness, or Catanus in Old Norse, is roughly 304 nautical miles. With a fair wind in the months of spring, 
This could mean as little as two days at sea. The proximity of these Scottish locations are a relatively short distance by sea to the Hebrides, Ireland and the Isle of Man. North of the Scottish islands finds us in the direction of the Faroes and Iceland, and westwards from there we have Greenland, Newfoundland or Vinland. This tells us that Scotland, and in particular the islands of Orkney and Shetland, were exceptionally well-placed and valuable locations to Norway in the Viking Age. There are multiple examples contained within the Orkneyanga saga of voyages made from the islands to various destinations in Scandinavia and a great deal of activity between the islands and the coastlines of Scotland. The location of the Scottish islands presented new opportunities away from home, but also close enough that should the need arise, the return journey could be made in a relatively short time. The topography of Scotland and Ireland was in many ways similar to Norway and had valuable natural resources such as timber and importantly the land was fertile and this was even so in the islands of Shetland and Orkney which are exposed to extremes of weather. The waterways that cut across both Scotland and Ireland were the roads communities settled next to and were ideal for Viking ships to navigate. The Viking longship is a powerful symbol of the era not just for ourselves in the modern day, but for the men who crafted and sailed these impressive vessels. Ships were the bearers of inspiring kennings, such as Sea God's Steeds or Sea King's Horse in Ale Saga, and names such as Iron Ram from Thorstein Viking's Son, or Olaf Tryggvason's Ormer and Lange, the Long Serpent, from Heimskringla. In fact, the ship was of such importance they were taken into the afterlife, as we see with the Osberg and Gokstad ship burials. By the late 8th century, the essential features of a Viking Age seaworthy vessel were in place. Strength, durability, speed, a sail, and a low-profile keel. If we look specifically at the warship, this design meant the vessel could sail onto the shoreline. The crew could then drag the ship across land to the next waterway, thereby significantly shortening the length of journeys and routes. And, if need be, this design also allowed for a hasty retreat. A variety of ships are mentioned in the sagas that range from small passenger vessels to larger cargo and warships. Dimensions varied according to purpose. For example, a cargo vessel or a nar had a fixed mast and was broader and shorter in length than a warship. It is estimated that a nar could carry almost 30 tonnes of cargo. One way to distinguish between a ship and a boat might have been the number of oars. These vessels were propelled by manpower as well as a sail. Twelve oars or less was considered a boat, while a ship had twelve or more. In the times in which the Vinland sagas were set, the design of the ships offered little in protection of its passengers from the elements. Conditions would have been cramped, considering the cargo required for an expedition. The crew and the passengers likely had hood fats, or sleeping bags in which to sleep, and chests for their personal belongings. Items required for an expedition, or even a raid, might have included tools, weapons, cooking utensils, preserved foodstuffs and barrels of drinking water. Replenishing water supplies, or making hot meals since no fire would be lit on board, required making camp on land which suggests a huge amount of preparation and that longer voyages were a far harder task for those involved. It is clear that people in this era were not only hardy, but practical too. However, that would not protect them from an outbreak of sickness or disease while at sea, something we will learn about through the course of these sagas. Orkneyinga saga Whose nickname is Diop Ulka? in Old Norse, which is usually translated as deep-minded, meaning wise, astute, shrewd, or intelligent. For those unfamiliar with Norse sagas and poetry, it might come as a surprise that a medieval heroine is valued for her brains rather than her looks, but this is a common feature of Norse heroines and women are often praised for their wisdom and sound advice in sagas and poetry. Eirik's saga gives us no information about when, how, or why 
Ruth acquired her nickname, but we could speculate that she contributed her insights and advised her kin during the family's rise to power. As mentioned previously, Ruth is a well-known figure from Norse literature. Her most memorable appearance is perhaps in Laxdala Saga, but she is mentioned briefly in Orkneinga Saga, where she is actually called the Deeply Rich. This source is not very well known, but it serves as an interesting backdrop to the era in which Ruth lived and the realities of Viking life. Let's look at this saga a bit closer. The Orkneyinga Saga, also known as the History of the Earls of Orkney, is a medieval document written around 1200 in Iceland by an unknown author. Over the course of 300 years, it chronicles the Norse earldom of the Orkney Islands and is the only document to feature Orkney as its central point of action. It belongs in the genre of King's Sagas though it does blend mythology, legend and history in a wonderful style with many dramatic moments, thus demonstrating the skill of the author. Recurring themes of the saga include gender, with some very interesting scenes involving women, a discord between families and kin, and the conversion to Christianity. The Orkney Islands are home to a phenomenal amount of history and archaeology. For many thousands of years, humans have lived and thrived in what one might consider a challenging environment. The Orkney archipelago includes more than 70 small islands and islets. Norse colonisation began in the 8th century, with Orkney becoming a vital connection in their western sea routes, and by the 9th century, the islands were under the rule of Norway and Denmark. Caithness was home to the ancient kingdom of the Picts, who named it Cait, and were dominant from the 5th to 9th centuries. They then began to merge with the Gaels coming in from the west, and perhaps due to growing pressure from the Norse, whose colonies were moving south from the Orkney Islands. The Norse had identified Caithness as a gateway to the Scottish mainland. The sovereignty of Caithness was a matter of dispute between Scotland and the Norwegian earldom of Orkney until the Treaty of Perth in 1266, when Caithness was once again recognised as part of Scotland. The saga begins with a curious legend. We then swiftly move on to the rule of King Harald Finehair of Norway. Many who were opposed to Harald's rule and dispossessed of their lands fled to the Western Islands, but using the Orkney and Shetland Islands, they began to raid the coast of Norway in the summer months. Infuriated by the raids of Vikings from the Western Isles, Harald led an expedition with a powerful fleet of supporters, and to put an end to this activity. His wrath extended from Shetland and as far south as the Isle of Man. El Roggenwald of Moor, a supporter of the king, loses his son Ivor in the fray, and is compensated with Orkney. At this point, he passes it over to his brother, Sigurd the Powerful, who becomes a successful chieftain for a time. We are briefly introduced to Olaf the White, Thorstein the Red, and of course, Uv the Deep-Minded. In the Paulson Edwards translation of the saga, chapter 5 relates how Earl Sigurd became a great ruler, who joined forces with Thorstein the Red, the son of Olaf the White, and Uv the Deep-Minded, and together they conquered the whole of Caithness, and a large part of Argyle, Mori, and Ross. It is a very short but significant introduction to Uv and her son, considering that by the end of this chapter, Earl Sigurd is dead, as a result of a wound received from the decapitated head of his enemy. In the Hjaltalin Gudi translation, Uth is known as the wealthy. In the text, we are told Thorfinn Hauskalif, or Skull Splitter, governed the land and became an old man. His sons were Arnvid, Havard, Lodvar, Liot, and Skuli. Their mother was Grelag, daughter of Earl Dangad in Caithness. Her mother was Groa, daughter of Thorstein the Red. This would seem to confirm a previous statement that Joseph Anderson, keeper of the National Museum and Antiquaries of Scotland in 1873, makes in a rather interesting and helpful foreword to the saga. Anderson tells us that after the death of Earl Sigurd, Thorstein the Red reigned as king over the lands that he and Sigurd conquered recorded in Land Namabok as Caithness, Sutherland, Ross and Mori. In the Laxdala saga, 
We are told he was successful, so much so that he was reconciled with the King of Scots and obtained possession of the half of Scotland over which he became king. However, due to the treachery of the Scots, Thorstein is slain in Caithness, prompting Uth's departure to Iceland following the death of her son. Uth arranges the marriage of Thorstein's daughter Groa to Duncan of Duncansby, an earl and marmor of Caithness. One might applaud Uth for this match. A marmor is essentially a high steward and a title of honour, and though the Norse earldom of Caithness was for a time returned to one of its native chiefs, by the subsequent marriage of Grilalga, the daughter of Duncan and Groa, with Thorfinn Hauskelief, son of Torf Einar, Earl of Orkney, the Scottish earldom was again added to the earldom of the Isles. Oath's participation in the saga is fleeting. However, she is present at a pivotal time in the history of the Norse occupation of Caithness and ensures the legacy of her son Thorstein the Red lives on in the future children of Groa and Duncan. Though the Orkneyanga is not a primary source for the life of Oath the Deep-Minded, it is nonetheless a fascinating observation when analysing her life and role as a woman in the Viking Age. In Eirik's saga, we only learn about Oeth in third-person narration, and there are no scenes in which Oeth speaks in first person. But although the prose is pithy and only touches on the highlights of the events that brought Oeth to Iceland, looking between the lines, the saga gives us an impression of Oeth as a brave, assertive, charismatic and resourceful woman, and a strategic thinker. In the first few lines of the saga, Oeth's husband, King Olav of Dublin, has barely been named when he dies in the next sentence. But Oeth and her son Thorsted carry on, and sail to the Hebrides, where her father lives. There, Thorsted contracts a strategic marriage to a certain Thurith, the daughter of a Swedish Viking, with whom he went on to have many children. Thorsted becomes a typical Viking warrior king forming an alliance with Earl Sigurd of Orkney, and together they conquer parts of Scotland, including Caithness. We are told nothing about what Oeth or Thorstedt's wife and young children were up to in these years, so we have to fill that in with our imaginations. But at some point, they go from the Hebrides to Caithness, Thorstedt's new territory. These were turbulent times, and alliances did not last forever. It does not end well for Thorstedt, and he eventually gets betrayed and killed by his so-called allies. Oeth is left with neither husband nor son. To quote the saga, Oeth was at Caithness when she heard of Thorstedt's death. She then had a ship built secretly in the forest, and when she was ready, she sailed out to the Orkney Islands. The saga relates the death of Thorstedt quickly and matter-of-factly and it shows no interest in Oeth's possible grief or other emotional responses to this loss. It also treats the escape from Caithness in an understated manner, but it must be stressed that it would have been a huge feat to pull this off for anyone, male or female. Building a ship was demanding for several reasons. One needed a great deal of economic resources, that is, materials for the ship and sail, if she didn't own one already, that is access to skilled workers who could carry out this kind of specialized labor, and organizational and leadership skills in order to supervise all this work and make sure the project was completed. Building it in secret added another layer of difficulty, and Oeth may have had to use her political savvy and tact to prevent word from getting to the family's enemies in the time it took to build the ship, weave a sail, and prepare for the voyage probably several months. The narrator of Laxdala saga is more explicit about how impressive Oeth was, explaining that people know scarcely any examples of a single woman getting away from such turmoil with such a lot of chattels and a large following. It is evident from this that she was the superior of other women. Marriage. 
In Orkney, Oeth bestowed Groa, Thorsted the Red's daughter, in marriage. She was the mother of Grieluth, whom Earl Thorfinn the Skullsplitter married. Once Oeth and her following are on their way, she is depicted in roles that are traditionally inhabited by men in the sagas. She becomes a matriarch who brokers marriages on behalf of her descendants, which was one of the main ways in Norse society to form political alliances and consolidate and strengthen the family's social prestige. On the journey to Iceland, Uth arranges a high-profile marriage for her granddaughter Gro with a prominent man in Orkney. The Book of Settlements states that she married another of Thorstedt's daughters off in the Faroe Islands and three more in Iceland. Arranging marriages in such a business-like way was a normal part of Norse culture. From a young girl's point of view, we might find it harsh to be deposited into a marriage to a stranger in a strange place, knowing that you might never see your family again, as is Gro's fate in Eiriksaga. However, children in that social group, both boys and girls, grew up expecting their marriage to have very little to do with love. So the news might not have come as a huge shock or been seen negatively. Sagas sometimes include a betrothal scene in which the young woman is given a chance to get to know the groom, or she is asked for her consent as a matter of course. But often she modestly replies that she will defer the matter to her father. On one hand, the sagas do show a recognition that it can be a bad idea in the long run to force girls into marriages with men not suited to them, either in social status or temperament. On the other hand, at the time of writing in the 13th century, the church was making growing efforts to push the issue of female consent. In the next episodes of this series, we will come back to the subject of marriage, but suffice to say that Oeth should not be understood as overbearing for marrying off the granddaughter in this manner, in the context of social norms, nor should we see her as lacking in female solidarity. There were likely no such expectations towards upper-class women. For all that we might find her behaviour problematic, in betrothing her granddaughter to an Orcadian magnet, it does what any Norse aristocrat would have done to maximise their chances of succeeding in a dangerous world. Kinship. Protection during this period was a necessity, and one method of ensuring protection of not only one's life and lands, but that of their families, was kinship. The basic principles of kinship can be found in various cultures, and in the Viking Age, it played a key role in their society. Kinship is essentially a system of social structure based on actual or acknowledged family ties, such as bloodlines, birth or marriage. There were also kinships that existed between those who were not connected by these basic factors, such as foster relationships. These bonds might have been formed with the ceremony of blending blood, very much like a scene from Thorstein Vikingsson's saga, where foster brotherhood and kinship are key themes. Over the generations, we find time and again men forming deep and lasting friendships and oaths, swearing to honour, protect and avenge one another should the time ever arise. A foster brother relationship can form in childhood, or, as we find in the sagas, men who have fought together or realise the worthiness of an opponent, and laid down their weapons and entering into the rite of Jarthermen, or the sod ceremony. Though kinship offered some protection, and helped to expand the power of a family, it was also susceptible to disharmony between its members. Infighting, feuds and vengeance could quickly escalate with disastrous consequences. The power of a clan and its political strength meant that families with large and wealthy kinships could conceivably affect the outcome of legal matters brought before an assembly. Violence was an aspect of life in this era. The sagas tell us about the right of home gang, formal dueling, einvigi, single combat, or killings in blood fury or vengeance. However, laws did exist and it influenced everyday life in medieval Iceland. There were complex edicts and penalties and assemblies called things where judgments were passed. From the sagas, we know that outlawry was a practice used to punish offenders, 
and that both men and women were subject to this practice. To be shunned and pushed out of the society you relied on for survival was a harsh and possibly fatal sentence, since none in the kinship were permitted to provide aid of any kind to the offender. Marriage was one way of securing alliances and extending one's kinship. A woman entering into a marriage maintained her connection with her blood relatives. She continued to belong to her original kinsfolk, and any children she might bear so too belonged to his mother's and father's kin. When a man and a woman married, they were tied by kinship to the extended families on both sides. This perhaps helps to better explain why rivalries and feuding between members within a kinship could produce such upheaval, and why some Norse texts are preoccupied with the dilemma for women of whether to be more loyal to their blood family or their husbands, but also why the loyalties of men and women extended beyond a single group. Uth would have understood the system well. She had negotiated the marriages of her son Thorstein the Red's six daughters, and, as we discover in Luxdala's saga, the marriage of his son Olaf to Alftis of Bara. It is to Olaf, her grandson, that Oath's lands are bestowed upon her death. By the time we reach this point in Oath's story, she has already taken land and settled in Havam. It is important to grasp what she had achieved by this act. Of the noblest lands Namsmen in the Westfirther's quarter, Oath is listed among them, as is her brother, Bjorn the Easterner. Land Namabok lists the members of Oath's kindred who make their way to Iceland and take land, and are recognised as a powerful kinship. Of the four most important settlers in Iceland, listed by Ari Thorgilson in the Book of the Icelanders, or Islingdengabok, only one is a woman, and her name is Uth the Deep-Minded. Landtaking Land in Amabok and Islingdengabok provide a wealth of information about the first landowners of Iceland. Landnamsmen essentially means those who take land, and applies to both men and women in the Landnama book. Landnamskonur refers solely to women, though taking land was a predominantly male role. The women who took land did so when they had no male representative to claim it in their place. The first settlers from Scandinavia seized this profoundly significant opportunity, bringing with them their families, slaves, wealth and cattle. They were in search of land and Iceland offered them a backdrop of rich, fertile inland dales, forested lowlands, and impressive mountain peaks. The story of Iceland's discovery began many years earlier. It is said primarily with Irish monks known as Papar, who were in search of an isolated existence, though their presence is not confirmed by archaeology. Nadad the Viking, who was in search of the Faroe Islands. Garthar Svaverson, who became Iceland's first circumnavigator, and Floki Vilgerthersen, who was the first Norseman to purposefully sail to Iceland, are credited in Landnamabok as the initial Scandinavians to set foot ashore. However, it was Norseman Ingolf Arnarsson who was to become Iceland's first permanent settler when, in 874, he built his homestead in the area he called Reykjavik. Iceland Ingabok provides us with an interesting viewpoint from Norway's King Harald Feinherr's apparent perspective on the mass migration of its wealthy landowners, who were opposed to Harald's taxation over the lands, which they had previously held in odal ownership. King Harald implemented the land order, a tax which Icelanders had to pay to the king on their arrival in Norway, and a land tax also had to be paid for licence of travelling or trading abroad. When the first colonists arrived, they were met with an empty land. There were no inhabitants, as the papar who had allegedly dwelled there previously were said to have fled at the sight of the new arrivals. Land was for the taking, and resources to support their new lives existed in the birchwood forests, coastal fishing, and the cliffs which were home to seabirds. It was from Norway that most of the settlers came, as well as many from their colonies in Ireland, Scotland, and the islands of Orkney and Shetland bringing with them their own families and everything they might need to start anew. How much land a person might take was an area for dispute. Some were accused of taking too much, 
as Lance Namabok describes to us in this excerpt. Those who came out later on deemed that the former settlers had appropriated too extensive lands to themselves. But legend has it that King Harold made them agree to this, that no man should appropriate more land for himself than he and his ship's crew could carry fire across in one day. According to Ari Thorgilson's Iceland Dingabok, all habitable land was taken within the first 60 years of settlement. This was a pastoral, fishing and agricultural community, and a lack of arable land also served as motivation to journey farther west, leading to Greenland, eventually North America, which they called Vinland. Colonisation. After this, Earth set out to seek Iceland and had 20 freeborn men on board her ship. Earth arrived in Iceland and spent the first winter at Bjarnarhöp with her brother Björn. Earth afterwards claimed all the land in the dales between Dögurðará and Skrömurhlaupsá. She lived at Kvam and she used to pray at Krossholar, where she had crosses erected for she had been baptised and was a devout Christian. Accompanying her on her journey to Iceland were many high-born men who had been captured by Vikings and who were called slaves. Vivid was the name of one of these. He was a man of good family who had been taken captive in the Western Sea and was called a slave before Öth freed him. She gave him Vivilstal and he settled there. Öth takes land and settles in Iceland doling out smaller tracts to her followers and giving many of them freedom from enslavement. Many Icelandic sagas begin with the story about how a certain family came to Iceland from Norway, and usually the patriarch of the family claims a large area, which he then splits up and gives smaller plots to family members, followers and also freed slaves, where they farm on their own. In this way, Earth behaves no differently from the stereotypical male settler. However, to nuance this categorization of Earth slightly, scholars have pointed out that the representation of Earth's settlement in the Book of Settlements does not conform to the literary conventions in depictions of land taking of male colonists. Male colonists are usually the first in their family to arrive in Iceland, whereas Earth comes only after her two brothers have already settled and established themselves. Secondly, many accounts record pagan rituals performed to accompany land taking. For example, Ingolver Arnarsson, the first colonist, threw his high seat pillars out of the ship for them to float to the preordained place of settlement, and then he held a sacrifice when he arrived. Such tropes in the Book of Settlements seem to have the function to show that the gods and mythological land spirits gave their favour to the settler, and symbolically they reaffirm male social dominance. These literary conventions construct the colonist as a virile man taking the land as his, but Ö's gender means that it would be inconceivable in the context of the Book of Settlements to depict her in this way. Thus, when Ö takes land, there are no mentions of rituals or spirits but only prosaic happenings such as eating breakfast, which gave its name to Dögurðarnes, breakfast point, or losing her comb at comb point. Saga map Readers of the sagas have long enthusiastically retraced the steps of the most compelling saga heroines and heroes. The Icelandic saga map project is led by Dr Emily Lethbridge. It's a fascinating resource that we highly recommend should you wish to take a look at the place names, geography and saga locations of Iceland. There is an interactive map, technical references to sources and materials used, and instructions on how to use the site itself. There is a link which will direct you to the Saga Steads of Iceland blog. It's a great resource and also covers the solo research project that found Dr Lethbridge reading each saga on location. We will include Sagamap in our links, which can be found in the show description, along with various place names we have mentioned today. Once Ö's group is in Iceland, the saga's version of events generally reflects the pattern in which Iceland was settled, according to written and archaeological sources. Most farms were the homesteads of individual families, 
living in households of about seven to eleven people, some of whom were relatives or dependents of the nuclear family, but others were likely servants or people held in slavery. Some slaves were released from captivity and given land of their own. It might come as a shock for some listeners that Eith, a Christian woman often regarded as brave and noble, would have kept slaves, but in most aspects, Eith's values were no different from those of her society. The Vikings rose to their enormous power partly through engaging in the slave trade, a lucrative business in the Viking Age, and keeping slaves was a feature of this society. When these people were then freed from enslavement and given their land to farm, it is doubtful whether they were free in any real sense. Those inclined to national romanticism may wish to see the first centuries of life in Iceland as a golden age, a period when free farmers governed themselves in democratic fashion, attending assemblies and having the freedom to choose their chieftain, with whom they had a reciprocal bond of loyalty. But this is a rosy-tainted view that has come under increased scrutiny by historians and it's more likely that a small group of magnates and their families ruled large territories, in practice if not in name, and often with an iron fist. The smaller farmers would have been more or less dominated by these higher up in the social order, and they had very little realistic chance to exercise individual agency, or go against the will of the local magnate. Thus, although medieval authors present Eith in the image of a benevolent monarch, we could imagine that she'd have kept the peasants in check should they get any ideas above their station. In past podcast episodes, we have covered the hierarchy of the Norse in the Viking Age, that is to say, a patriarchal society, comprised of a king, supported by the nobility, jarls, military leaders, and the wealthy and powerful landowners. The next level belonged to the freemen, or bondi, which consisted of farmers, skilled craftsmen, shipwrights and merchants, not forgetting the warriors or fighting men who belonged to a group called the hersir. The bondi were a diverse group and held some amount of power. In the Orkneyinga saga, the bondi frequently play an important role in the success of their earl. There are occasions when they come together to vocalise their displeasure with the methods or actions they are subjected to. At the lowest level, we have the thralls or slaves, whose lives must have been incredibly hard and no doubt miserable when we consider the hardships met by colonists overall. The settlers in Iceland were met with different challenges than migrants to the pre-existing colonies. Having no inhabitants, the land was uncultivated, the winters hostile. The interior of the island inhospitable due to its distance from the warmer coastal waters and home to an active volcanic region that did possess some benefits such as hot springs. In later episodes of the series, we will explore the impact these factors had on the population and the methods they used to combat such issues. Leaving this aside, there was another change on the horizon. Being separated from their homeland, the settler society evolved to better suit their surroundings. The Icelandic chieftains were called Gothar. This was a position of political, social, and for a time, religious importance. As we previously discussed, violence was an aspect of life in this era, but laws and penalties did exist, and were judged at assemblies called things. Cases or grievances were brought before the assembly of the Gothar, and the bondi who became thingmen to return judgment and to enforce the rights of the claimant as they saw fit. The accused were usually represented by one of their kinfolk. This was in place of a formal arm of the law that prevented individuals from taking said law into their own hands, and the sagas contain more than a few examples of notable conflicts. Eventually, there would occur a change in the position of the thralls or slaves. Vithal, a slave freed and given land by Uv, is the grandfather of Gudrid Thorbjornardottir, who happens to have a significant role in the Vinland sagas. The generations of Icelanders and settlers who followed saw the extensive lands claimed by the initial colonists divided up into many farms. This provided opportunities 
not just for newcomers, but for slaves who had been freed. The landowners had discovered a new set of issues with which they had to contend. Productivity did not counterbalance the rations required to feed a family and its dependents over the whole year, and having a large area of land meant the protecting of its borders. It is in the early period of settlement, and towards the end of her life, that Uth shares her land with those whom she has freed and is found to be loyal. Opinions are divided as to whether there was ever a historical oath, but her actions and character in the Saga of Eric the Red are corroborated in other texts written in medieval Iceland. Of course, the scribes could all have been working from the same original source, but many historians believe that there is some truth to the stories. One detail that differs between sources is Oath's faith and burial. In Eirik Saga and the Book of Settlements, Oath's Christian faith is highlighted, and they both record the place named Krossholar, or Cross Hills, where she allegedly prayed. The Book of Settlements additionally claims that Oath was buried on the beach because she did not want to lie in unconsecrated earth. On the other hand, Lakstala Saga scrupulously avoids talking about Oeth's religion. It makes no mention of Krossholar, and it claims that she was buried in pagan tradition, that is, in a ship burial, with a great deal of grave goods. It's fairly usual that separate medieval sources narrating the same events don't agree in every detail. On one hand, in oral tradition, a story changes over time and between one group and another, depending on who tells it. And by the time someone writes it down, they might have to decide between different versions, depending on what they or their sponsors thought was true, or best suited to their ideology, or the most entertaining story. On the other hand, Christian scribes were familiar with all kinds of narrative traditions other than Norse ones including biblical stories and folklore. And they sometimes used plots and motifs from other traditions to make their narratives more engaging or fill in any gaps. In the case of Oe's burial in the Book of Settlements, literary critics explain that the shore was regarded as a proper Christian burial place because the sea flowed all the way to the Holy Land and the River Jordan, and this would have given her grave consecration of sorts. By the year 563, St. Columba and his twelve followers had arrived on the shores of Iona. The monastery would be sacked on multiple occasions, following the first raid by Vikings in 795. In 806, a particularly brutal attack occurred when 68 monks were slain, forcing the survivors to relocate to Kells, County Meath in Ireland. It is thought they continued their work on the Book of Kells which had commenced in Iona. The Annals of Ulster records attacks taking place in 795 on the island monastery of Rathlin, just off the coast of County Antrim in Northern Ireland, and the island of Skye in the Inner Hebrides of Scotland. The Norse had surely discovered lucrative raiding opportunities. What is clear is that Christianity had existed in the Scottish and Irish domains for some time. In fact, it is thought the faith was first introduced to Scotland in 397, when St Ninian founded the first church at Whithorn in the area of Dumfries and Galloway, where he then set to work converting the southern and eastern Picts to Christianity. By the time of St Patrick's death in 461, he had established many monasteries and churches from his arrival as a missionary in Ireland in 432. The introduction of Christianity to the Scottish Hebrides is thought to have occurred around 600 AD. In the Orkneyinga saga, the Scottish Hebrides are referred to as the Suthriar, which is Old Norse for the Southern Islands, and were subject to internal strife among the earls of Orkney. The Hebrides were a prime location for forays to both Ireland and Scotland, for men who wished to raid, plunder and take land. Because of this, the Hebrides were a desired location for many. Oeth was an early convert to Christianity, according to these sources. Given that her story is set in the latter part of the 9th century, 
whereas Iceland and Norway didn't formally convert until many decades later. Her unusual religion could be explained partly by the fact that as she grew up and spent significant amounts of time in areas where the natives were Christian, that is Ireland, Scotland and the Hebrides, she would have been exposed to Christianity in settlement communities, which were probably somewhat hybrid and multicultural. Indeed, Erbike saga claims that Öðr converted in the Hebrides. In the sagas, there is also a convention of depicting women as being more quick to convert or being more devout than men. And we'll see more of that later in Eiriksaga. The Icelanders who wrote the sagas a few hundred years after the conversion tolerated a level of so-called cultural paganism, where Norse mythological motifs rooted in a pagan belief system continued to be popular and acceptable in literature. But it's also clear that the fact that their ancestors were pagan sometimes gave them cause for anxiety, as we will also see that female characters are so eager to embrace Christianity could be based in reality, but highlighting the devoutness of women they consider their ancestors could be a way for the narrators to compensate and reassure against some of these anxieties. Welcome to the part of the podcast where Johanna and I discuss some aspects of research we've particularly enjoyed, or thoughts we've developed over the course of the episode. Coming from a creative writing angle, my mind is preoccupied with Earth's life before the events in which we join her. The saga of the Air Dwellers gives us a little more of her family background, and Laxdale Saga provides us with an account of her last days. And although we have these sources, it still feels as if there's so much left unsaid. Definitely. Um, yeah, I love how Erdbeke Saga and Lakstela Saga kind of dramatise things a little bit more, especially Lakstela Saga. They have people kind of having conversations about why they're going away from Norway and, and to the Hebrides and these places. Um, I think Eric Saga, like the author, just kind of wants to get on with it and Presumably, they think that people just know about this stuff. Definitely, it's a great start to Eric's saga, but um, I think the more that we kind of started getting into Earth's life from the other sources, we realised just how, I mean, her life must have been pretty incredible, with the amount mm. of, certainly just the movement between countries that was going on. Yeah, and it just all seems very effortless, doesn't it? And it they does. just kind of jump <laughs> on a ship and then they're some other place. And, um, and, you know, when you start reading about, like, just how much work it was to make a ship or make a sail mm. or, you know, just the entire logistics of the journey. And, you know, you just kind of think like, OK, this is really a lot of work. And um, but it really sounds easy. And so they, they kind of come across almost as like superhuman when you start thinking about it. Yeah, definitely. I think there's so many elements kind of that have been left out. I mean, it must must have cost a, a phenomenal amount of money to have a ship built. And um, even just the cost and the production of the sail and everything like mm. that. And, and the time involved, it wouldn't have been a, a quick process at all. No, and I suppose that is sort of off the back of people who are being enslaved. And then, you know, talking about when when she's actually in Iceland and everybody's kind of being given plots of land. And, um, it, you know, they some of them seem to have been very high status back in Scotland and those places and they're, you know, earls. Although I think it was really interesting, I think, in um, the Book of Settlements, Lantnama book, uh, it talks about one of these women who was, um, you know, married to some, I think, Earl or, or s- some Scottish nobleman. And she had been almost like a, a lady in waiting to um, a, a queen or a, even higher woman. And she'd been like a midwife to her. Mm-hmm. And then Earth basically promises this woman, Mirkjö is her name. And Earth promises her freedom if she acts as her daughter-in-law's servant or lady's maid. Oh. Um, 
and treats her like a queen, basically, I think the, the text said. So do you think then when the settlers first came to Iceland, that social status does, still played as big a role in their lives? And if, you, if you're freeing your slaves, I wonder how that kind of works in the future, how the relationship would would be. Yeah, I mean, I think, think sort of, you know, in some ways, it was probably not a given that you would just keep your rank and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and even though the saga is kind of represented that way, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, everyone is just sort of deferring to them. Uh, that might not always have been the case in practice. And I think it was just very much kind of, you know, you, you just had to be really assertive and mm. um, show no signs of weakness. And I think that kind of explains why Uther is being so steely, really. Was there a particular moment, Tarak, of Uth's that demonstrates aspects of her character best for you? And I know that in this episode, we've discussed the idea of obstacles Uth had to overcome and the world that she navigated. Yeah, I mean, I, I find the silence is almost more compelling because, um, you know, she has this nickname, for example, Deep Minded, and we have absolutely no idea how she acquired it. And, um, you know, she must have done something. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, somebody at some point said, OK, well, from now on, we're going to call you that. And you just know that there were all these intrigues. Like, if you look at the other sagas, um, you know that, like, <laughs> people were just killing each other left and right and forming yeah. alliances <laughs> and then reneging on them. And, you know, and she's always there, kind of, along with the men. And so you just wonder, like, what she saw. Yeah. I, I think that's like probably the most interesting aspect of her, just how kind of mysterious she is. I think that's a really good point, actually. The descriptions that we do have of her, um, an idea that formed in my mind was that she was obviously a very intelligent and um, politically savvy woman, and mm -hmm. she definitely maximised the amount of movement and power that she had within the sphere that she, that she lived in, and did it really rather well. There seems to be this dignity um, attached to her, and, and I think that's even referred to. I think it's in Laxdal Saga um, that she died with as much dignity um, yeah. that, that she had had in life. Um, so I think, yeah, that description stuck with me quite a wee bit. Exactly, and, and this kind of lack of hesitation, and, you know, she's always kind of one step ahead of everyone else, yeah. and, and, you know, how... You know, Lex de Lassai especially says that, you know, there was no woman who was ever able to get away from a war zone with as many followers yeah. and, um, you know, just as m many assets, basically. And so that, that means that she must have been the most excellent woman ever. Yeah. And you just kind of, um, you have to admire that. And, um, you know, having the ship built in secret, you sort of, you're just reminded about, you know, how that sort of must have meant that she was making sure, you know, maybe she had spies and she was making sure mm. that nobody found out about it or she was maybe even bribing, you know, anyone living in the area not to say anything to their enemies and so on. So it's like, you know, she must have really had, had a lot of kind of savvy just to survive in this world. I think you definitely need it. Um, just from Orkneying a saga alone, that gives us a really good idea at how short and brief um, your life can be. Uh, we have a, a multitude <laughs> yeah. of characters that come and go. I mean, Oud's participation in that saga is quite fleeting, but it's interesting all the same. And just from that snapshot, um, she's lost her husband and her son. Um, mm -hmm. and. I think, gosh, that, what an incredible situation to be thrust upon you and to try um, and kind of do the best that you possibly can to remove yourself from from kind of any more danger um, as it would be. And um, yeah, and the aspect of her wealth, I think in one of the translations of Orkney and Saga, she's referred to as Uth the Wealthy. I wonder how big a part that, that played or that helped to kind of give her that freedom of movement to be able to do what she did. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it's really just, you know, monumental that she she must have had a lot of assets in order yeah. to do all this stuff. And that's something that, you know, if you read that against the sort of greater context of the saga, these high status women, it, 
money is really one of the things that sort of enables them. And um, like in, in, was it Ola Saga Helka, um, where, you know, there's this character Astrid, who I really love, and she kind of goes off and um, leaves her father's court and goes to propose to the king. And, you know, I, I think I also speculated in my book, like she must have had like horses and, you know, a, an ability to go um, to Norway and do this on a smaller scale. There's, you know, women who like actually d do use money to bribe people, mm -hmm. not to sort of go against their interests. And I, I do think, again, sort of just to stress that like these people were sort of, they were probably involved in both harrying and stealing, but also in trade. You know, they, they are trading all kinds of valuable objects, um, which they often steal, uh, although not of, uh, always, but, um, but then they're also like enslaving people and that's extremely lucrative. And, um, yeah. and you know, it's just like what they do and they don't really seem to have any ethical qualms about it, at least the way that the sagas are told. And it's just this kind of offhand thing. Yeah, it seems to be just a business um, that is very profitable and it's done and, you know, mm. and then we just move on to the next part of the story and it's, it's just very, very different from um, our own lives today. It's just something that we would find really hard to kind of understand fully. Yeah, and then I think there are a lot of sort of differences, as I was saying as well, between the slaves, you know, who are actually noblemen who have been mm. captured. And then, you know, there are descriptions of slaves, like in um, Rikstula, the, this one Eddic poem where um, the slaves are kind of being described as like really deformed and, um, you know, it's just really horrible how they're treated, basically. We kind of briefly touched upon Orkney Anga Saga um, mm -hmm. just as being a source and um, it's a good source concerning, I guess, uh, Viking colonies and the earldom of the Scottish islands, but it, it, it does lack something in the way of protagonists that you can really get behind or support, um, and a lot of them don't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> that is an aspect of the beginning of Eirik Saga, in the mm. sense that like, Thorstein is just mentioned and then he's dead, you know. Olaf, the husband of Eider, he's yes. also just mentioned and then killed off. But um, but yeah, I sort of felt like reading Or Orkneyga Saga, I felt like there were a lot of missed opportunities and it was such a shame because, the, you know, there's a lot of drama and then just gets kind of narrated in this really choppy way and it's just like... And then he became the ruler of Orkney, but then he died because um, his nephew killed him. And mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of drama there that um, could have been kind of milked. <laughs> I know, and I think um, two scenes that, or you know, two storylines um, the the that we kind of like are reduced to just a couple of lines and they could have been really expanded upon. One for me that I enjoy is the the two sisters Helga and Prakork and the the poisoned shirt I think um that's it's honestly it's just brilliant <laughs> it's so good it really is um it's really dramatic I think um at one point you have Prakork who's just tearing her hair out and weeping uncontrollably because mm. um she's responsible for you know the death of an earl um, and not the intended earl that she and her sister were kind of gunning for um and it's it's incredible it's really good part of the, the saga. I know that there's there's a storyline that you quite like as well. Yeah, although you sort of wonder with those two sisters whether the point is that, you mm. know, women shouldn't be meddling in politics or something like that. It's a very, and, very good point. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also like so typical that they're using poison and like in Valsuga Saga, Grimhild is constantly, um, you know, poisoning people or giving them yeah all kinds of drinks of, you know, to, to lose memory and so on. But, but yeah, like my favorite bit of Orkneyinga Saga concerns the daughter of Gunnhild and um, Eric Bloodex. Um, and, and it's just like, it's really intriguing and it's only a few lines again. And um, you just feel like 
you know, this could have been turned into almost a saga or at least a big chunk of a saga. Um, I agree. I think uh, definitely I, I um, wasn't ready for that part of the story to end at all. Um, oh. So good. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I love that. Um, I mean, it's like if you think about something like Macbeth, where Lady Macbeth is kind of egging her husband <laughs> you yes. know, to steal the <laughs> crown. And this woman is doing exactly the same. Um, and so she is um, married off to this uh, earl and then um, gets his brother to kill him. Uh, and then she gets like a nephew to kill the new husband. Yeah. And she's, <laughs> she's just kind of, you know, in, inciting everyone to, to fratricide and whatnot. Yeah. And you, you just think like, you know, a talented author could have made her into a, a memorable character. Definitely. Um, I just, <laughs> I, I, when I was reading it, I just thought to myself, She's got to be really unpopular with that side of the family. At some point, somebody is <laughs> going to say, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I just love that, um, you know, Gunhild is her mother and mm. she's obviously the kind of maybe most memorable queen of all Norwegian queens, apart mm. from Astrid. And, um, and she also has this sort of quite ambivalent status in the sources and she's um, really politically active and... Um, yeah, so you, you sort of wonder whether, you know, any of this actually happened, but um, mm. if this Ragnhild actually did exist, you know, did she learn her tricks from her mother? Well, yeah, um, that's, that's a really good uh, point. And I suppose that in, in some ways the women really aren't getting up to too much that's, that's different from the men. And I think the, the men are just kind of more outwardly violent about how they're getting <laughs> rid of their enemies. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, at least morally, they yes. <laughs> are neither better nor worse, I would say. Mm -hmm. I don't know, um, I don't really think that the saga authors hold these women to any different moral standards, sort of explicitly, like, they, at least in Orkney and Kassar, like, there aren't any kind of moralizing comments or anything like that, mm. but, um, but, like, they're definitely using different methods, and so you just have to draw your own conclusions from that, whether <laughs> the song author approves or, or disapproves. A book deal that we've both enjoyed is um, Gilbra Ogtskegi i Havami, which is a fascinating account concerning an elderly youth and a curious character called Gilbra, who, despite her best efforts, doesn't completely achieve what she sets out to. And um, it's a strange but highly interesting and entertaining story. There's a lot going on in it, in yeah. it um, you know, with Uyth being used as this character who is very religious, very devoutly Christian, and then Gudlway mm. shows up at some point, and, and she just comes out of nowhere, really, and um, and she's supposed to be very young and beautiful, mm -hmm. and um, and she wants to get some of the land in, in that valley where Uyth lives. And uh, she then s turns out to be this sort of pagan sorceress. It's, but she's alone, like Ovid. I mean, she's, a, uh, you know, it doesn't say whether she's a widow or, no, you know, what her status is. I, th I thought it was a really interesting folktale in that um, it, you know, it makes sort of really similar statements about how Ovid is this Christian in a really pagan society and mm. that she converted much earlier than most other people in. Norse society at least and I think it was Erbikasara that says that um, like her brother Bjorn comes to the Hebrides when she's living there and um, she and some of the other siblings they've all converted mm -hmm. in the Hebrides and he really doesn't like that and they have a kind of really fraught relationship and not like a falling out necessarily but they just don't really get along after that and then he decides to go to Iceland while they stay in the Hebrides in Scotland much longer. But then, like, so she, like, lives in Kvammur, but then whoever, you know, lives there after her, um, they are pagan. And so there's Skekke and his mother, mm -hmm. who doesn't get a name. I read a really interesting interpretation of the folktale, and it was kind of making the point that there are all these place names around there um, called Gudlbrá, something you know so there's good waterfall and mm -hmm. um, good ledge i think and this article was kind of making the point that this might be 
like a remnant of worship of Freya, who um, in you know the, the medieval sources Freya has all these associations with gold, and she even like cries tears of gold, and so it's not like a huge jump to go from like the you know golden brow to yeah. to weeping tears of gold, and so I think um, you know the kind of metaphorical you know aspect of the story of, of you know Gudra living in the the valley and um, she really wants these pastures and uh, fields which are extremely you know prosperous Skeggy our hero of the tale turns to god for help in defeating Gudra and is terribly hurt in the fray um it's quite a sad ending for him though he dies and has a simple burial marked by a mound of rocks yeah, exactly. Yeah, he just he gets buried somewhere yeah. um, in his land, but like he doesn't want to be in consecrated ground. Um, and the, there's some big rock there that you can still see. And you know that's a sort of very typical yes. folktale tradition, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's a part in the folktale as well where it talks about um, a stone on the shore that, when the tide goes out, that's the the marker or the place where Booth is is buried herself. Yeah, exactly. And so that's like how you know when the the high tide is or something. And it's just really lovely that these people are kind of everywhere in the landscape, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's um, it's something I've thought about a lot and it's a wonderful way to keep a memory alive, especially when um, it's you, you consider somebody like Earth who achieved so much in her lifetime. Yeah. And there is this kind of, I guess, Christian morality in the tale that Gudra wants to offer money for the, the mm. land and she doesn't want to take any money and so she, there are all these kind of temptations. It's sort of so many different like ideas that are coming through this folktale all at once and kind of really interesting how people are just like developing um, you know different aspects of the culture like and sort of threading or plying them together into mm. one story. I think actually it's, it's one of those folk tales. It would have its own podcast ep- episode. There's just so much involved. It's absolutely packed, full, lots of different ideas and imagery. Mm. And um, I decided to just um, roughly translate it into English, and um, I hope that like more people can read it and maybe tell us what they think about it. <laughs> Definitely, that would be lovely. And. And for listeners, we will include details of the folktale on our website, which you can find in the show description. You will also find a range of resources and links and ways to get in touch and let us know what you think of the series so far. Something else uh, we've been talking about is Ud's personality traits and how she might have provided inspiration for similar similar matriarchs in today's literature and, um, and on-screen characters too. Um, I think we were talking about uh, Game of Thrones and Olenna yeah. Tyrell. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah, and mm. I just remember when Olenna Tyrell came into Game of Thrones and became like a major character and I just thought like, wow, she is just so amazing and she has all these, <laughs> you know, zingers. And, and I think like one of the few people that she really respects is... Um, the, the Charles Dance character. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I sort of feel like if anyone were to make a movie about Aeth, I would want that actress to play oh, her. Um, Diana Rigg, I think, yeah. um, was her name. She was marvellous. Otherwise, probably Judy Bench or somebody. Yeah, I actually had written her down as well. And oh, then, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> and um, Maggie, I love Maggie Smith. She oh, yeah. is absolutely wonderful. Well, this has been an absolute delight, Johanna, and I think it's a wonderful way for us to kind of wrap up the the first episode. It's been a lot of fun. It has, and you know, we could probably talk about Aeth for another. We probably (laughs) could. um, I think we have a lot of other things, other good things in store as well. But I really can't wait to get stuck in that. Goodness, me too. Uh, We are going to cover some really interesting topics. And we would also like to say thank you to everyone listening today. In a moment, you will hear the first chapter of Eric the Red Saga. Following that, we have details of where to find us and how to get in touch, uh, which will also be included in today's show description.
Saga of Eric the Red Chapter 1 Olaf was the name of a warrior king, who was called Olaf the White. He was the son of King Ingeald Helgi's son, the son of Olaf Godrod's son, son of Hafton Whiteleg, king of the people of Upland. Olaf engaged in Viking expeditions in Britain, and captured Dublin in Ireland, and the Shire of Dublin, over which he became king. He married Uth the Deep-Minded, daughter of Kettle Flatnose, son of Bjorn Bunna, an excellent man of Norway. Their son was called Thorstein the Red. Olav was killed in battle in Ireland, and subsequently Uth and Thorstein went to the Hebrides. There Thorstein married Thurid, daughter of Ivan Easterling, sister of Helgi the Lean. They had many children. Thorstein became a warrior king and entered into fellowship with Earl Sigurd the Mighty, son of Eystein the Rattler. They conquered Caithness and Sutherland, Ross and Moray, and more than half of Scotland. Over these, Thorstein became king before he was betrayed by the Scots and slain there in battle. Uth was at Caithness when she heard of Thorstein's death. She then had a ship built secretly in the forest, and when she was ready, sailed out to the Orkney Islands. There she bestowed Groa, Thorstein the Red's daughter, in marriage. She was the mother of Grelod, whom Earl Thorfinn the Skullsplitter married. After this, Uth set out to seek Iceland and had twenty freeborn men on board her ship. Uth arrived in Iceland and spent the first winter at Bjarnahofen with her brother Bjorn. Uth afterwards claimed all the land in the dales between Dorgadur River and Skralmalops River. She lived at Fam and she used to pray at Krossalar for she had crosses erected, for she had been baptised and was a devout Christian. Accompanying her on her journey to Iceland were many highborn men who had been captured by Vikings and who were called slaves. Vifel was the name of one of these. He was a man of good family who had been taken captive in the Western Sea and was called a slave before Uth freed him. When Uth gave homesteads to the members of her crew, Vifel asked her why she gave him no homestead like the other men. Uth replied that this should make no difference to him, saying that he would be regarded as a distinguished man wherever he was. She gave him Vifelsdal, and he settled there. He married a woman. Their sons were Thorbjorn and Thorgir. They were promising men, and grew up with their father. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you have enjoyed Uth's story. Please feel free to get in touch and visit us on vidfurul.wordpress.com. That's B-I-D-F-O-R-U-L dot wordpress dot com. There you can find Gulbra Ogskegi Ihavami which Johanna has very kindly translated for us, but also links and texts so that you can follow the Finland sagas or research these fascinating women. There is a wonderful video to accompany the audio you have heard today. You can access it on the WordPress page or over on the Myth, Legend and Lore YouTube channel. Links will be in today's show description. We have some wonderful people to thank. The band Shell and Balam Prado kindly gave us permission to use their marvellous music, and we were delighted to share it with you.
Their fantastic albums are available on Bandcamp. If you've enjoyed the songs half as much as we have, you won't be disappointed at all. Shell's music focuses on making interpretations of 13th century musical masterpieces from all over Europe. And Bailen Prado has been playing the Native American flute since 2008. With her album, she shares her love for this instrument, which also helps to bring about a sense of relaxation and a connection to nature. The lovely hands-on history team allowed us to use amazing photographs of their work. Our video just wouldn't have been the same without these images. The team are experts in dissemination, preservation and revitalisation of cultural heritage. If you've enjoyed the images we've used and would like to find out more, please check out their Facebook page and website www.handsonhistory. The images of our Finland women have been provided by the exceptional artist Tiffany Kendra Clark. Based on the west coast of Scotland, Tiffany's work reflects the inspiration of Scotland's beautiful scenery in her paintings, prints and decorative pieces. We've included links to Tiffany's website, Facebook and Instagram page and wholeheartedly encourage you to view some of the lovely art that she has produced. Take care for now and please join us again soon for the tale of another woman from the Vinland Sagas.